now let me first uh, start by introducing Mr. Green, who will be interviewing our guest speaker. Howard Green is known to millions of Canadians. He is one of the founders of, and currently an anchor on, the, uh, the Business News Network, which is Canada's preeminent source for current information and business analysis. Mr. Green has won countless awards for his work in journalism and film, including a Gemini Award and two Emmy nominations for his documentary on Swiss Air Flight 111. In preparing today's speech, I was surprised to learn that Howard Green had already addressed the Empire Club of Canada. He, he looks pretty surprised at this. It was to an audience of this size, and it was in this very room, but it was in 1959. You're looking pretty good for your age, uh, Howard. Uh, I later discovered that Canada's former Minister of Foreign Affairs was uh, under Pro uh, Prime Minister Diefenbaker was another Howard Green. As for the opinion of the Empire Club of Canada, two Howard Greens are better than one. Welcome, Mr. Green. Since its, est its establishment in 1903, the Empire Club of Canada has provided a forum for the world's thought leaders. Speakers at the Empire Club have included Winston Churchill, Henry Ford, Indira Gandhi, Ronald Reagan, and the Dalai Lama. The Empire Club is a forum where great minds share their thoughts on issues of global and local importance. Today's guest speaker is indeed a person worthy of joining the ranks of this club's history. Mr. Griffiths is a Canadian business icon. He's a man described by several newspapers, including the Globe and Mail, as the Mr. Fix-It of Canadian business. Tony Griffiths has rescued several Canadian companies from their demise by employing his famous no-nonsense approach of management and leadership. A Harvard, gra uh, a Harvard graduate, Mr. Griffiths, Mr. Griffiths is known not only for his sharp business mind, but he's equally known around the world for his ethical approach to business and his personal integrity. He was once quoted as saying that if you don't leave your mother's knee with integrity, you will never have it. Tony Griffiths is a man who defines perseverance. He is a guy that just never gives up a fight. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to introduce to you today Mr. Tony Griffiths. I don't know how you're going to get there. But... I'm a high jumper. We'll get there, won't we, Howard? We'll slip through. You all right, Howard? <laughs> well, thank you for those warm introductions, and uh, welcome all of you, and thanks for coming out today. And Tony, welcome back to the show. <laughs> Wonderful to be here, Howard. Good to have thank you, you for having me. <laughs> so we're going to talk about corporate governance and. I'm going to say, actually, Penny, your wife, said that I could only ask you easy questions today. <laughs> but I'm not. Um, my first question. Before you start, okay. Howard. Yes. You're getting your book acknowledged here today, and I'm getting my book acknowledged here today. I thought it's only fair that the reason we're here is because of Barry Ryder and um, Andrea Wood. And Barry Ryder has written a book, that, a copy I have here, and I highly recommend it to anybody, particularly anybody who wants to become a director in Canada. This is the book. Now that's a book. Was it 1,040 pages you told me? It, it's Director's Duties in Canada by Barry Ryder. And <clears throat> I know some of you are laughing, but I want to tell you, you might not want to lie in bed reading this over the weekend, but if you have an issue on a board, this is a great reference document. If you, you want to uh, find out about a lead director's role or a chairman's role or a poison pill, it's all in here. So I highly recommend this book. And thank you, Barry, for having us here today, because Barry started the whole thing, I think. Thank you, Barry. There. 
So, uh, Tony, first question, and I don't know if the answer to this would be in the book, but given everything that is happening right now with boards, uh -huh. SNC, Agrium, CP Rail last year, why would anybody in their right mind want to be a director these days? <laughs> uh, 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 sorry. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a very good question, but you know, being a director in a business is like being a manager in the business or any other way. I mean, it's uh, something you do, and if you want to do that for a living, you go and take the director's uh, certification course at Rothman or Western or wherever, and um, you should do. I can't say I always did. You're checking on the company you're going to become a director of, so you don't walk into a hornet's nest that you didn't anticipate. But are, are directors right now scared because of the kinds of things that have gone on? I mean, the SNC board, by all accounts, a blue ribbon board, and then totally caught off guard by what happened. I mean, are directors scared, would you say? I don't know that they're scared. I think they're put on the alert, if you will. And uh, I say that because um, that's your job, and if you're doing your job and minding your P's and Q's, uh, you can stay out of trouble. And, you know, I, I have this funny feeling of why I'm even here, because the, the theme is governance, and I'm not a governance person. I tell you that right from the beginning. And you say, scared. I'm not scared, because everywhere I go, I have a guardian angel looking after me, on governance, you know, there's John Levin sitting over there, Rick Salzberg here, I don't know, I've seen several others, so uh, they, they look after me when, when we get deeply into governance matters. But, but how could something have gone, so, I mean, I don't expect you to be an expert in SNC, but just from a process point of view, how could something like that have gotten so far out of hand? I don't know, I think, uh, People are uh, all over the world with SNC and they're bidding on contracts. And, uh, you know, i give you one example. I was on the, uh, the board of uh, Mitel in 1985. And the day I arrived, the RCMP came into the, the company and they said, uh, uh, you guys have got a real problem. Uh, you've been selling uh, semiconductors to some country that was on the U.S. Uh, list of uh, people you couldn't sell to. And, uh, you know, it was a shock for me. And uh, they said, the next time we're out here, you're all going to go to jail. Well, uh, I just said, you'll never come again because I'm not going to go to jail and I'm going to make sure none of us in this room are going to go to jail. But it was a wake-up call. At the same time, we had people in India and Pakistan bidding on contracts, and we always came at the top end of the technological side of the bids, but we never got an order. Who got the orders? Siemens, Ericsson, I don't know, all kinds of people. I don't know what happened, but I had my suspicions, and then, of course, I think it was Siemens that was taken through the ringer a couple of years ago on, on this kind of stuff. And Maybe they were doing that, I don't know. But we never got an order, so we pulled all the people out. It's, it's, I don't know the answer. Mm. Does anything have to change in the, in the way boards interact with CEOs, CEOs interact with boards in order to prevent these kinds of things? Obviously, it hasn't happened at every company, but this is a pretty major company. Does something have to change in that relationship? No, I don't think so. I think, you know, if you're on a board and you're not happy with the CEO or the CEO doesn't like you for some reason, you probably think about moving on one way or the other. I mean, there has to be an element of trust between the management and the, and the board. And as long as that trust exists, you're fine. And, uh, you know, if you're going to be chairman of a company, uh, it's great to have a company that works like a clock, like one I this table here, because you don't have to worry about it. Uh, you know, every quarter they come in when they met or exceeded their targets, 
and everything's going well, so you're relaxed. It's when the company then gets into trouble that you find out whether you've got a good chair or you don't. And, and what's, I know you want to talk about this, what, what's the difference in, in your view? What separates a good chair from a bad chair? Well, first of all, I, maybe there should be a course on chairs, but my own view of a good chair is somebody that is a constructive inter interface between uh, the management and the board and creates a sense of uh, cohesion and uh, a constructive collegial uh, atmosphere. And uh, unfortunately, I mean, I've been in a number of boards where the chair decides that he or she is more equal than other directors. And of course, uh, you can correct me, Rick, but uh, all directors are the same. Uh, so once you come to a decision point or point of a debate about an issue on the board, all the directors are equal. And these chairs somehow think they uh, have more power. And then they, at times of my experience, exercise close to a veto. So then you get a division on the board, and that's, that's extremely unhealthy. And other chairs see themselves as a, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, a cheerleader. Uh, they, they have a special bond with the CEO, so when the thing gets into trouble, they're protecting the CEO when they should be uh, moving away and listening to their fellow board members. So those are two kinds of issues. Where So a good chair tries to build cohesion and consensus. Let me ask you about directors then beyond the chair. <clears throat> I know you said earlier you're not, a, not so much a governance guy, but it's, it's inescapable. Um, to, to avoid that word here, I think, today. I mean, there was such, as you know better than I, there was such a big fuss about governance after Enron and WorldCom and so forth, and right. Sarbanes-Oxley came in. It's almost been forgotten. It's such a quaint notion relative to what happened in 2008, 2009. But that brings up AIG and Lehman. I mean, why didn't directors act, in your view, in those kinds of cases? Or let me ask you more broadly, why don't directors act when they should? I can't answer that question except in my own experience. Uh, I guess I put it this way. If you ask a, a lawyer uh, about a board issue, you get a, what I call a professional legal answer. If you have, ask an accountant a similar question, uh, you get a professional answer, professional because they are professionals. But if you have a generalist as a director, Sometimes they're there because they have a good name somewhere and they're not really business people or uh, for them it's a point of cachet or something. And I think what I would encourage anybody to do that's a, a director that's uh, to maintain your pre professionalism is to do your own homework. And uh, I've always said to myself, if I don't like what's happening, what would I do about it? and I figure out what to do about it and present that. And sometimes you get a buy-in from the board and other times it becomes very divisive. But aren't you at the mercy of how much information the CEO is willing to give you? You are sometimes, but uh, you know, uh, I'm a great fan of what I call benchmarking. Uh, you get into a company and it's not doing well. And uh, the first thing I do is say, uh, what are the competitors doing? And you analyze what your competition is doing. And I had a great example of that at uh, Harding Carpet back in the early 80s where, you know, I didn't know anything about the carpet business. And the CEO who had been there a year and been recruited as a carpet expert came in and the thing got worse after the year. And I, we said to him, uh, what's what are we going to do about this? He says, oh, you can't. Don't worry about it. All, all our competitors are in trouble. So I went to my office and I got out the financial postcards. Most of you don't remember what they are, but <laughs> this before the internet. And I got the financial postcards and I got eight carpet companies and I started looking at them and bang, here was one making a lot, two making lots of money. So then you work back from 
there and say, why are they making money and we're not making money? I, I guess the parallel would be the, uh, the uh, Ackman CP takeover because one has to wonder what was going on in the CP board. My guess is they were sitting there thinking they were okay and they were doing fine and somebody else said, you're not doing fine. They didn't seem to rise up and deal with it. I mean, they just lived in their little cocoon. How about they were paralyzed with fear? Well, if they should have been alert to the benchmarking of that industry uh, so that they shouldn't have been put in the position of fear. They, they should have initiated things that were forced upon them later on. I'm sitting here looking at a gentleman called Bill Gregson. He's my classic example of a guy that's brought into a company called The Brick. And in one year, he transformed it for the better. He's asleep right now, so he's not. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we've seen in the, in the last while a lot of CEOs move on from their jobs. Um, and my question is, why don't we see more boards get shoved out? We see CEOs get shoved out all the time, but boards went along with Rio Tinto's acquisition of Alcan. The Barrick board approved the acquisition of Equinox. Uh, the, list, the list goes on. Uh, why do boards survive and CEOs don't? Well, it's odd that you asked me that because just in the last week or so, I, I was reading The Economist magazine and there was an article, I think the title of which was Shareholders at the Gates. So the prediction is, and it's probably true, it's gathering momentum, is that shareholders are standing up and saying, we're not putting up with this mediocre performance of a company or where somebody goofed, so what's he or she still doing there? So I, I think that's the first indication. The second is, you know, we're all human and uh, I think what happened to the Rios of the world and there's so many examples is you had this boom in raw materials and uh, the, the uh, top people in the management got carried away with euphoria and bought these things at the peak prices of iron ore or gold or whatever it was. And uh, when the stone sinks, I mean, the criticism now, as you, you've seen, is there are a lot of boards that have been criticized because they're still there, although the CEO got bounced. I don't know. It, what about stock performance and, and, and boards? I mean, you, you've got examples of many companies with, with good boards, uh, but their stocks don't do so well. I'm thinking, say, Thomson Reuters, say, General Electric are two big examples. Yeah. where they have, the stock hasn't gone, th their stocks haven't performed particularly well for a number of years, yet they have arguably strong boards. Uh, is there anything that you can talk about in that regard? I mean, is there a responsibility on the part of the directors to somehow get better stock performance? Well, I think it's a, a huge responsibility, but on the other hand, I guess I'm a little old-fashioned if I don't if I don't think a company is performing well, I should sell my stock and move on, you know, and somebody else can come in. Uh, but uh, those directors, uh, you know, you give it a little time, uh, two, three, four years, but if it happens that the company is languishing after five or six years, maybe one of these uh, guys like Ackman will come along and do something with it. I saw him on your show once. He was very good, I thought. I don't know him. <laughs> what would you do if Ackman came a-knocking? I mean, if you, were, if you had been on the CP board, for instance, what, what would you have Well, done? I would have hoped that if I'd been on the CP board, I would have done my homework. And particularly at the time when people were, uh, like Ackman, were starting to rattle the saber, I'd do my homework and say, is this guy crazy or what are we missing here? But it seemed to me that uh, the CP board took on what I would call a siege mentality, and they, 
They didn't react to it. And uh, I always say you can control a situation for a while, and you can get to a point where you lose control, and then it's all over for you. What about the is issue of succession, um, CEO succession? Many um, governance types have told me over the years that that's the number one responsibility for a director, making sure that there's a proper succession plan in place. I don't know if you agree with that, but in the, in the instances of Rogers and Encana, for instance, it seems like those companies caught the market by surprise. All of a sudden, there were announcements about their CEOs leaving, in the Rogers case, over a longer period of time. Uh, but how big a responsibility do directors have on that score? Well, you say it's the first obligation of a director. I think it's probably the second. The first one is to hire and fire the CEO. I mean, if you have the wrong CEO, you've got to get rid of him or her. Uh, uh, that's the first issue, and I guess that dictates the second, is if you're going to do it, you better have something else in mind. And I, most companies I've been involved with, they, they have a plan. Uh, you don't always enunciate it because uh, there's no need and, and you don't know when the guy's going to get hit by a truck or anything, so you, you carry on. But you do have a plan and yes, definitely it's the board's obligation to have one and it's very satisfying when if you own a stock and something happens to the CEO and there's a predictable transition, it's very comforting. At one point you said he and then you said and she. Uh, uh -oh. I <laughs> I'm already in trouble. <laughs> women on boards, women in the corner office. Uh, I'm all for it. And in fact, I'm, as, as they say, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> in this morning's Globe and Mail, there's a headline under governance that women are smarter than men on complicated situations. I have it in my little black bag here if anybody wants it. But it's coincidental. But um, look, there aren't more women on boards because when I was graduating from business school, first of all, there were no women in business schools, let alone mine at the time. And now there are increasingly women in business schools. And increasingly, I think it, uh, a couple of them, the women now uh, exceed the number of men. So what I always say is that the pool of women uh, eligible, by that I mean properly trained in business, hasn't been there until now. And my prediction is it's, it's in the crossover period right now and the pool is growing. And uh, give it another 10 years, there'll be more women on board, especially with an article like this, because it's probably true, women are smarter than men. You know that, Howard. I do know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to follow up, though, because, uh, you know, there have been a lot of women in business schools and in law schools for a while now, um, at least, you know, through the period since I've been, uh, since I graduated from school. But the, the pace of change has been glacial. I mean, every year Catalyst comes out with its report and the, the numbers virtually stay the same. I don't know what they are. 13% of corporate directors are women. Uh, less are CEOs. Why is it glacial? Even though there are those women out there, presumably with the qualifications and more qualifications than well, I, I don't have a finite answer to that, but... Uh, what I think is happening is, is that uh, I use the analogy of back in the 60s, uh, it became, a, people started saying, we've got to have a French speaking person on the board. There were so few eligible names uh, for that back then because typically in Quebec, uh, you were brought up to be a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher. Uh, so there wasn't, again, the pool of talent for business there. Now, if you want a French-speaking director, it's a piece of cake. And I think women are coming up uh, through layers at the banks and uh, at other places. 
and the long and the short of it is, uh, um, I, I, is again, I, it's, it's just a question of time. It's going to happen. What, what about when people leave boards? We do have people who occasionally leave a board. Uh, there's a notification, but you never, the public never finds out why, unless yeah. there's a, a source who shall not be named. Um, person familiar with the situation. Um, should companies have to disclose why people leave boards? Because sometimes, presumably, it's relevant and material to... Well, it could be. Uh, I mean, the, the company that comes to mind, of course, is Hewlett Packard. I mean, they've been through this two or three times in the last eight or ten years. So they have an accident-prone board. Uh, but from my point of view, I guess there's, unless it's some horrible reason, I mean, the best time to leave a board is when the annual meeting comes up. So you just say, I don't want to stand, and you can, you can use a lot of reason. But if you, if you choose to leave in the middle of your term, it is awkward. And unless you want to blow up your company, if it's a bad reason, I guess there's a tendency not to talk about it. I mean, uh, it could be detrimental to the company, depending on the reason. What, what do you think about the, uh, the courses that people are taking to be directors these days? Oh, I think they're outstanding. I mean, I, this didn't exist uh, till the last sort of 20 years, and uh, many, many of them, as you know, and I, I think it's a, a terrific thing. And once again, I would say every director should have a copy of this book on their course because, uh, in fact, if you read this book, you don't need to take the course. <laughs> Barry, do you have them on sale here today? Yeah. <laughs> By the way, I should, I should say that Howard is writing another book. You know he wrote uh, Banking on America. He's writing another book about his own life. It's called uh, Fifty Shades of Green. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? I'm blushing, Tony. <laughs> um, yes. He, Where he was I? Take orders outside. <laughs> There's the camera. Uh, we're, we're getting near the end, and, and I hope you've Thank thought God. of some uh, questions because we're going to open it up to questions in a couple of minutes. But, you know, I want to end on something positive uh, because I'm ha I've been hammering away at you here. Um, you, you like the notion of so-called rebounders. Yeah. People who've had a knock but come back. Yeah. And can you, can you put that, can you frame that for us in the context of our conversation here today and corporate life. Yeah, I, uh, actually, uh, that word came to me out of a book I read not too long ago. It's called Rebounders, and it's written by a guy I think called Rick Newman. And it's a story of sort of like 10 individuals who had crises in their lives of one kind or another and rebounded. And I think of the, so many people uh, that I know in business, uh, particularly entrepreneurs, is uh, actually a, a friend of mine whose board I was on in Ottawa called, his name, uh, the, the name of the company is Callion Technologies, very successful company. And it was written by uh, the guy that founded the company who subsequently uh, became a controversial mayor of Ottawa, Larry O'Brien. And he's just published a book called uh, Ethical or Entrepreneurship. And in there, he talks about his first attempt at building a business and how he was so naive, he got completely wiped out. And he picked himself up the ground and started all over again. And in this book, The Rebounders, there are three or four really interesting uh, articles, uh, chapters, one on uh, Bogle, who built Vanguard, equities group. He, he had terrible problems in his early life before he pulled off the winner. Another one is James Blake, the tennis player who had a very bad accident, nearly broke his neck. And then after he broke, uh, he was out for two years. And then he came back and he, his father was dying and he was close to his father. So 
That put him aside for another year, and then he got shingles in his eye, of all places. And actually, uh, being a tennis fan, I happened to watch uh, the tennis last night or the night before, and there he is playing. So he's a rebounder. And I think of so many people I know that have, uh, this is what you call a mature audience. I, I'm used to speaking to, I, I don't mean you, Brian. <laughs> this, this, I've, been, I've been out talking about my book to MBA students, and all these MBA students sort of say, you know, how, how do you do this, and where are you going, and all this sort of stuff. And the only advice I give them is, first of all, look at your business life, number one, as an adventure, and B, if something bad happens and you got knocked down or you lose a lot of money or something, well, get up and what I say, grow out of it, which would be a rebounder. So that's what a rebounder is. All right. Well, that's great, Tony. Thanks yeah. very much. Thank you, Howard. And we'd like to open it up to questions now. So if there's anybody who has a question, please uh, pop up and uh, we'll run a microphone over to you. And uh, we've got a few minutes here that I, I see a hand already uh, over here. We can get a microphone over. And if you can please identify yourself and where uh, you go. Hello. Uh, my name is Mike Jessup from Rotman. Uh, first off, I'd like to, on behalf of the Rotman students here, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Griffiths, uh, the Empire Club, and RBC for allowing us to be here today. Very interesting. Uh, Mr. Griffiths, question for you. You had mentioned earlier that the chair is responsible for, the maintain, uh, for maintaining the cohesion amongst the directors, that all directors should be equal. Uh, my concern is, though, that uh, for this pressure to be equal, that there was probably a situation in which there's a lot of peer pressure to go along with someone's idea. And I'm wondering how the chair can help mitigate this sort of groupthink that can lead to suboptimal decisions. So the, the question is exactly? How to avoid groupthink yeah, on a board. It's, it's difficult. Uh, it's very difficult because uh, if, you, if you don't have the facts, and I think the secret is to come up with some sort of position paper or a strategy that that you can gel around, and if people disagree with it, uh, then you have got a problem, and uh, that's when you get factions on boards. Uh, um, if you, uh, I guess in the in the back of my book, I talk about a a, a matrix that I use on companies, so it forces you to gel around a plan or so, and if you, if you can't gel around it, you got a big problem, and uh, that's when these board wars arrive and when you have uh, dissidents coming on the, on the table. You talk about envisioning the future of the company in that matrix. And Absolutely. Actually, Thinking yeah. about how much money you want to make at the end of the, at the yeah, end of the and road. this goes back to my comments about benchmarking. I mean, you take the best people in that particular industry, best operators, and you see what they're doing, and then you say, "How do I get there?" Because there's no point in trying to fix something uh, if you don't know what your ultimate goal is. I think there's a Chinese saying that if if uh, if uh, you uh, if you don't change direction, you'll end up going, going where are you going? In other words, if you don't have a goal, forget it. And the worst thing to me is not to have a goal and be trying to fix something because you don't know where you're going to wind up. I should say it's a great book. It's called Corporate Catalyst, and uh, you can pick one up outside there today. Um, any other questions in the group? Hi. Mr. Griffith, um, thank you for your presentation. Um, are high school students today, are they presented with a curriculum that um, prepares them for the next layer of education? And secondly, with the technology, they can just click on and get an answer. So how are they going to develop their ability to problem solve? You're asking me about how students are prepared for the next level and problem solving. 
Uh, well, the first thing that pops into my mind is, you know, I went through school and high school and liberal arts school, and I had no idea what a mortgage was or interest rate was or anything, so there wasn't that preparation. And somebody in the in the uh, 70s or 80s wrote a book called The Wealthy Barber, and I would recommend that book for any child growing up because these things are simply explained. And nowadays, I mean, there's so many ways you can educate kids because of the internet and sort of virtual courses you can take on the internet that uh, any school should encourage that, in my view. Any down here? Yes, sir. Uh, this is going to be trouble. <laughs> <laughs> May I call you Mr. Griffiths? Yes, yeah. always. <laughs> I'm interested to know how you feel when a hedge fund steps up like Mr. Ackman has done, uh, and on the other hand, uh, how Jana has recently done with the current situation. Uh, I think uh, that the hedge funds, um, you might say, operate with very few rules of engagement whereas the companies who might be defending, if you will, uh, are always under the scrutiny of various and sundry governing bodies and are at a bit of a disadvantage because they're always denying something that they've been accused of. And I guess my concern is that when a hedge fund, as a dissident shareholder, steps up and takes issue with how a company is being run, um, they often are acting in the short-term interests of their own shareholders uh, versus the long-term interests of the uh, target company's shareholders. And I just wondered how you, how you feel about uh, companies defending against uh, short-term interests of a hedge fund who might own 5% of your stock uh, versus the long-term good of the company, which uh, with, I might say, a proven track record in the case of Agrium, um, I just think it's, it, they're operating under two sets of rules. Well, I is think... It, is uh, there a question somewhere in there? <laughs> the, uh, the world is divided into hedge funds that are after short-term gains, uh, and you think of names like Carl Icahn and so forth that, that do that, and there are others, I mean, I don't know Mr. Ackman, but I, I, I got to say, uh, for the shareholders of the CP that hung in, he did a good job. Uh, he, he really did. So I'm not sure you can generalize on it. Uh, I've been uh, in, in situations where uh, the company hasn't been performing. I'm thinking now of Leach Technology 10 years ago. and. Uh, we were saved by the bell from a, from a uh, hedge fund, but uh, and because we hired a new person who came in and transformed the company, so we had another shot at it, which sometimes you don't get. But on pr in principle, I, I'm supportive of people that are going to build the company on behalf of the shareholders. Sometimes uh, they're pretty aggressive. It's better to do it in a friendly way. Uh, and there are people that do that. I was watching a gentleman on your show the other night. Um, Eric Rosenfeld? Yeah. And basically, he likes to get in with a board and build rather than blow out the place. And uh, it sounded like a better way to go. Uh, but if you don't keep the company uh, alert and moving forward and keeping up or getting better than the peers, I, I'd say you deserve to get thrown out. Yes. Where? Yes, at the back there. Oh. Mr. Griffiths. Yes, sir. Many of the, uh, 
well-established or successful corporations have been either founded or managed by people who did not have or did not complete a formal education. So when on the board you're trying to select a CEO, what are the human characteristics you're looking for in a CEO? Not the professional characteristics, but what are the human characteristics that make a great CEO? I guess the first words that come to my head are leadership abilities. Uh, communication abilities, integrity, uh, somebody that will lift the team in place and drive it forward, and uh, is that it? Any? Uh, excuse me. Hi. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my question is with regard to dual class structures in Canada, where you might be a director of a company that has. Uh, shareholders' interests in mind, but the shareholders might be in two classes, one with votes, one with no votes, one with multiple votes, one with just one vote. So if you're a director of a company like that, and perhaps you have been or choose not to be, I'd like to hear your views as, as a director and as the dual class structure itself. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's certainly... Uh, a structure that exists widely in Canada, particularly in the communications business. Uh, you know, I can argue uh, that some of the great companies have grown up in that structure. One is Power Corp, for example. Uh, and uh, actually, years ago, um, a friend of mine uh, uh, named Michael McMillan was CEO of a company called Alliance Atlantis, where actually I met Barry Reiter and uh, Andrea Wood. Uh, the long and the short of it is, uh, Michael came to me one day and he said, I'm, I'm gonna go public. And uh, uh, I said, well, I, have you thought about creating a dual class of shares? And Michael said, yeah, but my RBC financial advisors and my lawyers, I think they were Tories, but I'm not sure, said, you can't do that. I said, Michael, look, you go in the next morning and you tell your lawyers and financial guys that you couldn't sleep last night. Uh, you, you don't want to lose control of your company, and if you don't have this structure, you might lose control of your company. So um, see what happens, but have a very grave face. And he did that, and guess what? They said, you can do it. So he did it, and, and about two years later, uh, he called me out of the blue, and he says, I'm so happy you gave me that advice because I just learned that Izzy Asper has bought 19.9% of my voting shares, and if I didn't have that, I'd be dead. So I can argue for it. Well, I think uh, we are out of time. Sorry to leave anybody who had questions, but uh, we, we've been getting the uh, time signal. So uh, thank you all. Great questions. Thank you again, Tony. Thank you. Keep smiling. <laughs> I'd like to call upon Mr. Barry Ryder from Bennett Jones to do the formal thank you. Thank you. Um, it's, a, it's a great honor to be called on to thank our speakers today, um, not just because of the kind words that uh, Tony was able to, a person like Tony is able to, to say about my book project, but also because today represents a bit of a fulfillment of a dream for me. Uh, I was on the board of Alliance Atlantis with Tony for, for many years, and we talked about things during board meetings and prior and after them. And one day, Tony mentioned he had a manuscript for a book. And he started telling me what it was about, and it was his experiences as a business person and lessons he'd drawn from business. And I asked him if he'd let me read the manuscript. And under strict conditions of confidentiality, he gave it to me. I took it home with a plan to read it over a few weeks. And I started reading it, and I did stay up all night because it was an amazing manuscript. And I remember calling him the next day and saying, Tony, you've got to publish this thing. It's, it's fantastic. It's full of great lessons. And he said, well, there's only, there's only two ways I can do that. He said, either I've got to die 
or I've got to divorce my wife because <laughs> she, she won't let me publish this thing while I'm alive because of, it tells the truth about my experiences and these aren't always flattering of, of the people I've run across. Uh, well, anyway, Tony is a courageous person and I'm delighted that, that we didn't need death or divorce and, uh, and the, <laughs> the book got published and we're here today to hear some of the lessons that, that came out of it. Uh, I commend the book to you highly. Uh, if you haven't read it, you should. It's full of the kinds of lessons that you heard a few of today, but almost on every page, there's, there's a great story about some event and there's a lesson. And I, when I was writing a book review of this uh, a few months ago, I, in, in trying to draw a few themes out of it, I had a, a huge problem because there were just so many lessons all over the place, everywhere you look. There's something worth learning, and that comes out of the kind of, uh, of amazing career and amazing mind and integrity that, that a person like Tony has. So I'm delighted that you were here today to, to hear this. Tony, thank you very much for, for sharing some of your insights, and Howard, thank you for drawing out uh, some of the points you did. Much appreciated. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Barry. And on behalf of the Empire Club, we'd like to present both of you with a book. It's a copy of Who Said That? A selection of quotes and notes from 100 years of the Empire Club. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave this at your place. Finally, each of you should have at your seat a, a list of upcoming events. I'm pleased to let you know that we have a number of great speakers that are coming. Uh, tomorrow, we have Justin Trudeau here at the Royal York Hotel. And uh, on Thursday, April 4th, we have Richard Garneau, President and CEO of Res for, uh, Resolute Forest Products. Uh, I'd like to thank Russell Metals, Inc. and Deloitte for sponsoring our event today. And thank you to Derek Leahy of RBC Dominion Securities for sponsoring our student table this afternoon. For those of you interested in purchasing a signed copy of either Mr. Griffith's book, Corporate Catalyst, or Mr. Green's book, Banking on America, How TD Bank Rose to the Top and Took on the USA, they both kindly uh, agreed to do a book signing after this lunch outside. I'd like to thank the National Post as our print media sponsor. This meeting will be carried and aired on Rogers TV. We're very grateful to Rogers TV for their ongoing support. We're now on Twitter and Facebook, and as well our own website, empireclub.org. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to our speakers. We look forward to seeing you again soon. This meeting is adjourned.